Tough Bugs, Bacteria and Antibiotic Resistance. It was on a shortcut through the hospital kitchens that Albert was first approached by a member of the antibiotic resistance. Psst, hey kid, want to be a superbug? Stick some of this in your genome. Even penicillin won't be able to harm you. Let's start at the beginning. Remember what you've learned about bacteria. They're simple, small, prokaryotic cells, meaning they lack a nucleus and organelles. However, they are incredibly diverse. They live in every nook and cranny of our world, and we are still discovering new bacteria and trying to learn more about them. You might recall that they reproduce asexually by a process called binary fission, meaning that each individual bacteria simply copies its genetic material and divides in two, creating two daughter bacteria that are clones of the original parent. This is referred to as vertical gene transfer. In addition, bacteria have the ability to exchange genetic information in the form of small chromosomes called plasmids in a process called horizontal gene transfer. Bacteria can exchange genetic information with other living bacteria of the same or different species, and even with dead bacteria by picking up bits of DNA in the surroundings as bacteria die and release their contents. Bacteria are ever-present in our world, and we need them to survive. As you remember from ecology, bacteria, along with fungi, perform most of the decomposition, playing a vital role in recycling the nutrients that we need in our world. They also are instrumental in a process called nitrogen fixation. They're able to take nitrogen from the air and convert it into a form, another molecule, that living organisms can use. And they are critically important for humans. We use them to make many foods. We use them with industry, including modifying them through biotechnology to be even more useful to us. They are a part of us. We have many, many, many species of bacteria that live inside our bodies, collectively referred to as our microbiome. And they are important to many aspects of our health. We wouldn't be us without them. That being said, some bacteria are harmful to us. They are one of many kinds of microorganisms that can be referred to as pathogens, along with viruses and some types of parasites, etc. And when we are infected with these types of bacteria and they start to multiply, they can be very harmful to us. So we have a variety of ways that we try to control and eliminate the bad bacteria. We may just wipe them out with toxic chemicals such as alcohol or bleach. We may use heat as when we cook our food or cold as when we refrigerate our food. For eons, humans have preserved food with things like salt and sugar or acidic vinegars. This alters the environment, making it difficult for the bacteria to survive, either because they cannot function in the osmotic environment or in the pH that is created. In the case of some pathogenic bacteria, we have vaccinations that we can take and then our bodies will undergo an immune response, allowing us to fight off that bacteria if we encounter it in the future. And finally, humans have developed antibiotics, chemicals that are able to kill bacteria once they are in our bodies. Antibiotics work in all different ways. Sometimes they interfere with physical parts of bacteria, particularly the cell wall. Sometimes they disrupt a critical part of the bacteria's metabolism the molecules that it's able to make or break down or interfere with the process of protein synthesis, usually by interfering with bacterial ribosomes, and even with cell cycle regulation, preventing the bacteria from dividing and reproducing normally. Now there's a difference between antibiotics and the sort of over-the-counter disinfectants 
described on the previous slide. The over-the-counter disinfectants, by and large, just completely destroy the bacterial cells. In this case, there is no selection for resistance because the cells are all dead. And usually these work in some kind of a physical manner, literally breaking down cell membranes and cell walls to destroy the cells, or in some cases, destroying the proteins that the cell makes. Now, where did we get these antibiotics? Uh, antibiotics have been on Earth for as long as there have been bacteria. When the bacteria compete with each other or with other organisms like fungi, some of them are able to make a substance that we now call an antibiotic that is able to destroy their competitors without harming themselves. How did they get to be able to make this substance? A random mutation or perhaps a gene that was acquired from another bacteria. Any bacteria that were able to make such a substance did a little bit better and produced more bacteria with the same ability. Now, as you might imagine, that's not the end of the story. The bacteria that are exposed to the antibiotic may have some protection. They may have a gene also acquired through random mutation or as genetic information from another bacteria that allows that bacteria resistance in some way prevents the antibiotic from harming them, perhaps by breaking it down or moving it out of the cell. In this case, those bacteria will survive and pass on their resistance to their offspring. Use this image to help you think about how this works. There are many, many bacteria a few of them might have resistance to an antibiotic. When they are exposed to the antibiotic, most of the bacteria will die. But perhaps a few that just happen to have this resistance already will survive. And those are the bacteria that will reproduce. Not only that, but these bacteria may pass on this drug resistance in the form of genetic information to other bacteria around them, whether they are the same species or even other species, in the process of horizontal gene transfer. So if you think about the process of natural selection and how we describe that process through the acronym VIST, we can follow along to see how this works in more detail. As with any population, there is always going to be variation in a population of bacteria. And we know if we take a random sample of bacteria, that some of them will already have mutations that give them resistance to our antibiotics, simply because they have genes to make many different kinds of chemicals. In addition, bacteria are constantly gaining new mutations, which occur frequently in bacteria because they reproduce so fast. And recall that mutations occur naturally during the process of DNA synthesis, which occurs as bacteria multiply their genetic information prior to dividing. Bear in mind that all of these traits, these chemicals that are made in the process of protein synthesis, are inherited because they are a result of genes. And again, bacteria can pass them on through asexual reproduction or through horizontal gene transfer. In the process of selection, that is, when the bacteria are exposed to antibiotics, the least resistant bacteria are going to die the soonest. Antibiotic resistance is what we call progressive. That means it's not all or nothing like a light switch. It is possible for bacteria to be more or less resistant to a particular antibiotic. And in that case, it's like knocking down a wall. The weakest walls will be knocked down first and the weakest bacteria will die first. But gradually, if the bacteria are exposed to more and more antibiotics for a long enough period of time, the less weak, the stronger, the more stronger bacteria will eventually be killed. 
we say that the more resistant bacteria can survive a higher exposure, that means a higher dose of the antibiotic, for a longer period of time. What type of selection is this? For practical, practical purposes, what this means is if bacteria are exposed to an insufficient dosage or length of exposure, meaning not quite enough to kill all of them, then there will be survivors that are, in fact, stronger. In other words, antibiotic-resistant is both dose-dependent, the dose of antibiotic matters, and time-dependent, the period of time that the antibiotics are present is also important. So therefore, if you want to make sure to kill all the bacteria, it's important to maintain a high dosage and a long enough period of exposure that all of the bacteria are killed. This is the only way to prevent selection. Because if there are no survivors, then even the strongest do not pass on their genes. Now, it does take time in the form of multiple generations to select for antibiotic resistance. Because with each generation, the strongest survive, have offspring, and therefore the population has a higher and higher frequency of resistance genes that are more and more effective in resisting a particular antibiotic. However, in bacteria, there are, this can take a short amount of time overall because the bacteria have such short generation times. In other words, they can reproduce in a very, very short period of time and produce many, many generations in a relatively short time for humans. This enables them to evolve very quickly. In other words, for a higher and higher proportion of bacteria to have the trait that is being selected for. This graphic shows you some ways in which antibiotic resistance is spread. In many cases, it occurs in animals as we use antibiotics in their feed. In some cases, it occurs in humans. It can be spread from animals to humans, from humans to other humans, and from bacteria to bacteria inside of all these organisms. By the way, note that the caption at the bottom of this graphic is incorrect. It states, simply using antibiotics creates resistance. That's a false statement, and a very common one used in the media. The antibiotics do not create the resistance. Resistance occurs as a result of random mutations. What antibiotics do is select for that resistance in a population and cause it to be more prevalent or more common. So it simply takes an existing problem and makes it worse. Make sure that you understand the difference. One of the most famous examples of antibiotic resistance is with a type of bacteria called Staphylococcus, commonly referred to as a staph infection. This is a very common bacteria that is normally in our environment and in a healthy person doesn't cause any problems. However, if a person has an injury or a wound and it is infected with a staph bacteria, then that can become very serious indeed. A little history. Back in the day, as you may have heard, many, many people died from bacterial infections. And in fact, in the 1940s, when the first antibiotics led by penicillin came on the market, they were viewed as a miracle drug because for the first time, doctors could easily stop infections by giving a patient an antibiotic. And many, many, many lives were saved, especially during World War II. What doctors found very quickly, however, was that the same antibiotics that had been so miraculous, bacteria quickly became resistant to these antibiotics. And as new antibiotics were introduced, 
bacteria became resistant to them as well. This continues to the current day, except that now we really don't have new antibiotics to introduce. As you can see in this graphic, most of our traditional antibiotics are no longer as effective as they used to be because many bacteria have become resistant to them. And the development of new antibiotics has slowed to a trickle. The staph infections that I mentioned before, the bacteria has evolved into a form that we now refer to as MRSA for multiple resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Unfortunately, this infection is often acquired when a person is in the hospital and causes a terrible kind of infection in which the bacteria is able to eat away human tissue, creating wounds and in infectious areas that cannot be healed easily and cannot be treated with most of our antibiotics. These infections are often lethal because they are able to able overtake the body's own immune system and we do not have effective medicines to treat them. Most people don't realize what a serious medical problem this is. Tens of thousands of people die every year in the United States because of antibiotic-resistant bacterial infections. And those people can be young and healthy. A routine injury can become fatal when there is a massive infection by an antibiotic-resistant bacteria. And MRSA is only one of the problems. One of the most urgent threats, according to the Centers for Disease Control, is antibiotic-resistant gonorrhea. Gonorrhea is already one of the most common sexually transmitted diseases. In the past, many of these cases could be easily cured with antibiotics. Not anymore. Fewer and fewer antibiotics work against gonorrhea. There are strains of gonorrhea that are now resistant to every possible antibiotic known to medicine. Right now, there are only a small number of these strains in circulation. However, it is only a matter of time before they become more and more common and more and more people acquire a bacteria for which there is no cure. Another concern is bacterial pneumonia. Many people already die of pneumonia, and this number is likely to go up if we cannot treat them with antibiotics that are effective. Worldwide, tuberculosis is of great concern. Again, without effective antibiotic treatment, the death rate is likely to increase. So what's driving this problem? Partly, it's the overuse of antibiotics. Most importantly, in factory farms. In many large factory farms, antibiotics are fed to the animals because it slightly increases their growth rate and because the conditions are very unsanitary so that infections might thrive. Often these animals are given a small dose of antibiotics over a long period of time, mostly to increase growth. Thinking back to what facilitates antibiotic resistance, remember that it is time and dose dependent. So giving a small dose over a long period of time simply selects, selects, and selects for the strongest bacteria without ever killing them. Perfect conditions for the evolution of antibiotic resistance. Less important, but still significant, is the fact that we are exposing our own bacteria to antibiotics in the forms of products marketed to kill bacteria and put in products from soaps to cleaners 
to toys and surfaces. Again, these products do not contain enough antibiotic to actually kill all of the bacteria. They simply select for the strongest. In the medical field, there's a long history of antibiotics being misused. People who feel ill, usually from a cold or a flu, go to their doctor and expect to be given something to help them. And historically, it was easier for doctors to simply give people a prescription for antibiotics, whether it was going to help them or not. In addition, patients would get antibiotics. They would often take them for a few days, begin to feel better, and begin to have side effects from the antibiotics themselves. So they would often quit taking the antibiotics and not complete their full dose. Again, creating perfect conditions for the development of antibiotic resistance. This is a huge problem for society, in part because it is expensive, but more importantly, because more people die. And the ones who survive have more severe infections that require more treatment. This threat has been known for a long time. Here's a quote from the man who discovered penicillin several decades ago. The problem was immediately apparent. There's the danger that the ignorant man may easily underdose himself and by exposing his microbes to non-lethal quantities of the drug, make them resistant. So we've known about this problem for a long, long time. But as with many long-term problems in our society, for example, climate change, it is difficult for us to deal with a long-term problem in the short term. It is easier to put it off and put it off and put it off until the problem becomes larger and larger and very difficult to solve. Today, up to half the antibiotic use in humans and much of antibiotic use in animals is unnecessary and inappropriate, and it makes everyone less safe because it increases the selection for antibiotic resistance and increases the frequency of bacteria that possess this trait. Why is this allowed to continue? Well, there's a tremendous amount of political and economic pressure for business as usual, and there is not a lot of investment in the development of new antibiotics that might help. Part of the reason for this is economic. Antibiotics themselves are not particularly profitable drugs. Patients use them for just a short time, so they will not continue to purchase them and make profits for the pharmaceutical companies. In addition, it is sometimes wise to hold an antibiotic and save it until it is needed because of the problem of antibiotic resistance. But in that case, the manufacturers that develop them are not making any money. So there's not a lot of incentive for them to continue the research and development needed to bring new antibiotics to market. It has been suggested that Congress could replace the current system with something called a market entry reward, meaning the manufacturers would get a large sum of money up front to develop a new antibiotic and then give up their patent on it. This would allow public health officials to deploy the drugs as needed in the wisest way possible to treat disease, rather than a method in which the more they are used, the more profit is made. It might also make these drugs available to developing countries at a, an affordable price. There is some hope on the horizon for new types of antibiotics that may not be subject to the problem of antibiotic resistance. For example, this young woman has developed a type of polymer that is able to kill bacteria in a way similar to something like alcohol or bleach. It simply destroys the cell membranes in a process somewhat like apoptosis. Bacteria that are exposed to this are killed, and there is no known resistance because of the method in which the polymer works. 
it is possible that we will be able to develop more antibiotics like this, but it will take time and investment. Researchers develop new ways to fight superbugs. Drug-resistant superbugs have rendered many antibiotics ineffective. But now there's hope. Currently, the only treatment for bacterial infections is through the use of antibiotics, which, after passing through bacterial cellular walls, kill bacteria. However, bacteria over time can mutate to protect themselves, commonly through developing an efflex pump, which expels antimicrobial polymers. Researchers at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Texas have discovered a synthetic compound that blocks FX pumps, making superbugs once again vulnerable. And researchers at the University of Melbourne in Australia have developed a star-shaped peptide polymer, which is non-toxic. This polymer can fight bacteria in multiple ways, including ripping apart the bacterial cellular wall, making it difficult for superbugs to become resistant. Both methods still need to be refined, and both research teams are still working toward human trials. Again, there was a factual error in that description. Bacteria do not mutate to protect themselves. Some of them already have a mutation which helps them to survive, and those bacteria are, for, are selected for. Make sure you know the difference. So what can you do? Well, you can try to participate in the market by buying antibiotic-free meat and discouraging the use of antibiotics in meat production. On a personal level, you can use antibiotics only when needed. That means when you have a bacterial infection, not a cold or a flu virus. And when you do take them, take them exactly as they are prescribed, for the full length of time, the full dosage, even if you're feeling better, even if you have side effects. In addition, you can avoid the use of antibacterial products. For example, soaps that contain the antibiotic triclosan. The Centers for Disease Controls recommends that if you want to reduce your exposure to bacteria, simply wash your hands with soap and water. We know that is the best way to reduce the number of microorganisms on your hands. If soap and water are not available, it is fine to use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. However, be aware that most hand sanitizers do not have a high enough level of alcohol, and most people do not leave them on their hands for long enough. So they are often not as effective as claimed. So if you do choose to use a hand sanitizer, make sure that the hand sanitizer is touching your skin directly, not through a layer of dirt or grease, and that you leave it on until it dries completely. However, the best way to eliminate bacteria, again, is simply washing your hands with soap and water. And when you do so, do it correctly. Wash for at least 20 seconds, that's singing happy birthday twice. Scrub all the parts of your hands and your fingernails and under your fingernails. Rinse well, dry, and try to keep your hands clean afterwards. That's it. Let me know if you have any questions, and don't forget to wash your hands.